My name's Amata, and in this Red Gaming Tech video, I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Now, I know you guys are missing Paul. He is safe and sound in Seattle at the moment. He has said that he's just shifting the last of a cold that has come on just a perfect time as he's gone on holiday. You know, that's just great. Um, basically, he's saying that once that's shifted a little bit, he's going to be doing some vlogging as well as there's some pre-prepared content that you guys have already seen some of, but there's still some stuff coming. So, what do I have for you today? Well, quite a few interesting pieces, if I do say so myself. We're going to kick things off with Intel, as we have, have a couple of pieces from them. And the first one is going to be the fact that a patent was filed by them for a Bitcoin mining hardware accelerator. Then the next thing is, well, we're not quite done with security vulnerabilities, as we now have something by the name of Branch Scope. Next up, we're going to be revisiting NVIDIA for a bit as we have a new ARM SoC as the roadmap has been updated. And then, finally, from NVIDIA at least, we're going to have something regarding the GeForce 11 series. And then we're going to end things out on a slightly unusual note because it's regarding the Nintendo Switch, but it is tech-related, so do stick with me on that one. Anyway, let's begin things, as I said, with the Bitcoin and Intel. Now, before I go anywhere... Obviously, just because there is a patent doesn't mean necessarily this is going to be a thing that is real. However, the fact that it's just been published might mean they've been working behind the scenes on stuff. But before we get all into all that, basically, Intel has some plans to introduce a Bitcoin mining hardware accelerator to the market. And the application itself is for a, quote, Bitcoin, Bitcoin excuse me, mining hardware accelerator with optimized message digest and message scheduler data path. Now, this was actually submitted in September of 2016, so it's been around for quite some time, but again, it has just been published. So basically, Intel's intent here is to create a chip that could basically improve the existing Bitcoin mining process by increasing energy efficiency. And the patent reads, quote, because the software and hardware utilized in Bitcoin mining uses brute force to repeatedly and endlessly perform SHA-256 functions, the process of Bitcoin mining can be very power intensive and utilize large amounts of hardware space. The embodiments described herein optimize Bitcoin mining operations by reducing the space utilized and power consumed by Bitcoin mining hardware. And you might go, okay, but do they actually have any sort of forecasts on what we can expect in terms of the reduction? And well, apparently it's going to be able to be cutting power usage by much as 35% and could be added to a bunch of stuff, including CPUs, SOCs, FPGAs, as well as, of course, ASICs. Now, it's an interesting technology and a much needed one for anyone who's into mining, because even if you have a vague interest, even if you vaguely looked into mining, even if you don't mine yourself, one of the things you probably will know is that it takes a, a rather high amount of energy to actually do any mining because obviously it requires a high powered rig and requires that rig to be utilising a lot of power and obviously it needs to be on basically all the time as well. So this would be nice to see but uh, we'll have to wait and see as to what actually happens there, but definitely interesting to see Intel tackling this in a more direct way. Now let's move on to Branch Scope. Now a couple of viewers have actually sent this to me, so thank you very much to Henrik, and of course Pavan who emailed us directly, and Henrik, for those of you curious, messaged us on Facebook. So if you ever have any tips like this, please do message them to us as it can be very helpful. So basically, Branch Scope is a new side channel attack which was discovered by four security researchers from the College of William and Mary. And this is a college in Qatar, as well as the University of California Riverside and Binghamton University. So, according to their paper, which you can find linked in the description below this video, the Branch Scope attacks basically are a little bit more sophisticated than what was actually being done with Spectre and Meltdown, but they can do basically the same damage. They can exploit a security vulnerability to retrieve sensitive data from an unpatched system, including stuff like passwords and encryption keys, by manipulating the shared directional branch predictor. Just for completeness' sake, here is a quote from the paper, which reads, quote, The success of the attack largely depends on the ability to perform branch manipulations with precise timing. The attacker-controlled OS can easily manipulate victim execution timings. For example, the attacker can configure the Advanced Programmable Interrupt Controller, or APIC, in such a way that Enclave code is interrupted after several instructions are executed. So, yeah, not brilliant that yet another security vulnerability has raised its ugly head. So you might say, okay, that's all 
that's all well and good, but, you know, kind of cut to the chase here. What is actually affected? Well, the researchers who discovered this demonstrated this particular attack on three recent I-5s and I-7s, including Sandy Bridge, Haswell and Skylake. Now, to be honest, this is pretty bad, but we shouldn't, like, panic and run through the streets just yet. The guys who discovered this have proposed hardware-based mitigations as well as software-based, and we do actually already have a statement from Intel regarding this, and they said this statement to Softpedia News, who said, quote, We have been working with these researchers and have determined the method they describe is similar to previously known side-channel exploits. We anticipate that existing software mitigations for previously known side-channel exploits such as the use of side channel resistant cryptography, will be similarly effective against the method described in this paper. We believe close partnership with the research community is one of the best ways to protect customers and their data, and we are appreciative of the work from these researchers. So the TLDR of all of that is they're basically saying that the fixes that are meant for hardware, sorry, for Meltdown and Spectre will fix this as well because they are similar as I've already said but still not brilliant that the saga of security flaws is yet to be finished and to be honest I wouldn't be surprised to see yet more coming out not necessarily more security flaws just more sort of fallout from this not only from Intel side from AMD side as well because obviously this whole CTS labs thing obviously AMD did address that recently and you should go watch our video on that if, if for the humorous skit if nothing else so yeah hopefully Intel is right, and we're not going to need a whole new bunch of patches and microcode and hardware fixes to fix this new update. Hopefully it is just going to be fixed by what they're already doing for Meltdown and Spectre. But I suppose it's better that we know than not know, I suppose. Anyway, let's move on to NVIDIA, and our first segment is going to be ARM SoC. Now you might wonder, okay, why are you talking about NVIDIA and ARM in the same breath? Because, well, they don't sell new ARM-based SoCs. The last one was, of course, the Tegra X1. But that's publicly. They have continued creating them for private uses, and obviously the main use for these at the moment is being their NVIDIA drive systems, and the Xavier SoC is obviously at the heart of the single SoC Xavier module as well as playing a part in the multiprocessor Pegasus module, which is going to be for level 5 vehicles. So Xavier itself is just now sampling to partners, but NVIDIA, not one to rest on their laurels, already has their eye on the future, and they have updated their ARM SoC roadmap. And we now have the wonderful name of Orin. Unfortunately, NVIDIA is playing a little close to the chest when it comes to actual details regarding Orin. All we know is that it's a single chip solution and that it's going to be next gen NVIDIA SoC. Unfortunately, they're not also, so they're also not, excuse me, giving us even a slight indication of the performance that we can expect, other than that they're hoping to replace Pegasus with a couple of Orins. And Pegasus, just to kind of give a bit of sort of context to this is a pair of Xavier's with a post Volta discrete GPU attached. So basically you've got two Xavier's with this dis discrete GPU making up a Pegasus and then you've got two Orins replacing that. So it kind of sim streamlines things somewhat and will probably bring some more power to the mix as well. So very cloaked in mystery but uh, still interesting to say the least but what you're really interested in I know you are, is the GeForce 11 series. So most of us were hoping, praying, that we're going to be getting a GeForce 11 series reveal at GTC 2018, but unfortunately that didn't come to pass, and we got some interesting stuff revealed, it wasn't really for the consumer at all. But now we might finally know an inkling as to what's going on, as according to a memory supplier, we're going to be getting the GeForce 11 series in July, and they're going to be based on the upcoming Turing or Ampere graphics architecture. Now, one architecture is going to be for us, the PC gamers, and the other is going to be for AI and compute markets. If I had to guess, the Turing one will be for the AI, but obviously that's a pure guess, well, a guesstimate, I suppose you could say. But the point is, that's what this memory supply is saying. Now, you might wonder, okay, but who did these rumours come from? And they're actually from SK Hynix, and they confirmed to Gamers Nexus that their GDDR6 memory is going to be ready for mass production in three months for use in NVIDIA products that are upcoming. So this basically confirms that GDDR6 is going to be utilised in GeForce 11 and again that we're going to be getting it around July, potentially later, they didn't actually say July, 
but they said it's going to be ready in three months for use. So we might see it a couple of months after July, but basically we're looking at the starting point of at least July going on from there. So we're going to be getting something from the 11 series this year. Now, of course, do treat this with the usual healthy dollop of salt and skepticism. Because even though this is coming from SK Hynix, until I hear it from the mouth of NVIDIA, I'm not going to count my chickens. We should just bear in mind that, that this could be pure speculation and all that sort of stuff. So we shouldn't say, yep, it's coming out in July. Definitely 100%. No, it's maybe potentially coming out in July and it's maybe potentially coming out a couple of months after that. But even that could be incorrect. We could not be seeing it until 2019. So do just keep that in mind. But it is still interesting to see SK Hynix saying this. I mean, I hope we get the E11 series in July, because that means we're probably going to know what the hell it is in the next couple of months. But even if we see it in, like, say, August or September, I'd actually be okay with that. Even October would be fine. What would kind of be annoying is if we don't see it until 20, uh, 2019, excuse me. But obviously, that wouldn't be the end of the world, but it would be kind of frustrating. I don't see NVIDIA waiting around that long, but of course, I could be wrong. I don't know what issues they might be having, and obviously... I don't know, you know, their market project projections and all this other stuff. But either way, the current rumour is that we're going to be seeing it around July or potentially later. So let the speculation commence, my friends. It's exciting. Anyway, let's end things with the Nintendo Switch. Now, obviously, I do sometimes throw in some console news into these videos if I feel like a bit of spice. But while well, this is, of course, console related because, well, it's about the Switch, it is more about the technology of the Switch itself as... Basically, there's an interesting thread which has surfaced on Reddit, r slash Nintendo Switch to be exact. The thread is going to be linked in the description below this video, published by a Intoxicus5, and basically they managed to find several Google Docs which are linked in the Reddit thread, so I'm not going to link them separately. Just click on the Reddit link if you want to give them a look-see. And basically what this person in the Google Docs is saying, and this is a fellow by Nathan K. And basically he'd done a bunch of testing because you might have seen the recent reports around people bricking their Nintendo Switches by using third party chargers and all that sort of stuff. And Nintendo came out and said, you know, please only use the official Nintendo ones. So basically Nathan K took it upon himself to do a bunch of tests and had basically come up with the results that the Switch is not USB-C compliant and quote, overdraw some USB PD power supplies by 300%. And another direct quote which sums up all of this nicely reads, quote, the Nintendo Switch dock USB type power supply is not USB PD spec compliant. As a result, it does not play nice with other USB-C devices. This means you should strongly consider only using the Nintendo Switch dock adapter only with the Nintendo Switch. Additionally, it seems the Nintendo Switch dock does not play nice with other USB PD chargers. This means you're forced to use a Nintendo brand power supply. So basically what they tried to do with the Switch is use USB-C, so it's like, hey, you don't have to get your own special Nintendo TM charger, you know, obviously like they've done before, where you had to have that charger for that thing. You can just grab, you know, say, just for example, any old micro USB charger just to throw, pull a common charger out of the air and plug it in. You have to use their thing. So they, they did that by using USB-C, but they have used non-standard USB-C protocols Basically meaning that they should have just used a proprietary connector because it comes to the same thing. Like, yeah, you've got, you've got a USB third-party charger or a third-party dock or whatever, but you might not want to use that because you might end up bricking your console because Nintendo are Nintendo and have used, again, non-standard USB-C protocols. Basically meaning that, for all intents and purposes, you might as well have used a proprietary connector. So, just to play it safe, guys, just do stick to the Nintendo-only chargers and all that sort of stuff. It is a bit disappointing to see this, to be honest. Like, use proprietary stuff all you want, that's totally your choice. I would have preferred that, but if you're going to use a standard thing like USB-C, then you can't blame people for being like, oh, I can just use third-party stuff then, because that's what they're going to do. I mean, how many third-party controllers that look like the Xbox controller are out there are there? You know, how many third-party controllers are there that use USB, just for example? So, I don't like that they've done this, to be honest. I would have rather they just used their own special Nintendo weird plug-in thing rather than USB-C, because then they could have avoided this whole thing. However... There is one thing to keep in mind, which Nathan K himself points out in the Reddit thread. Basically, he does completely own up to the fact that this is old data. If you look at the Google Plus posts, his first one was posted in May of 2017, so almost a year ago. But he does say that he stands by his old data, but he does advise, keep in mind, data may have changed 
over time as well. And I'm going to read a direct quote from his post here saying, quote, the studies need to be repeated for new firmware, new hardware, new chargers, new behaviors re-examined. That's a job for Nintendo, peripheral makers, their engineers, power users, and, re and rep reputable review sites to do. Check the data, come to your own conclusions, run your own tests. And inform public is the best vanguard for ensuring companies only sell good products. That applies for everything. So we should be concerned about this report and the fact that this was ever true is still disappointing as I just said a moment ago. But I'm just saying let's also keep in mind what he said. There should be more tests conducted. But if this is the case and if it has led to people bricking their consoles for a new fault of their own, then Nintendo may have to issue a statement and potentially replace those brick consoles. Because to be fair, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with using third party. Yeah, Nintendo said, oh, we always recommend you use Nintendo products. But when you've got a USB-C, people just think, oh yeah, you, you say that because you don't want me to use a controller that's bad quality. Or you'd rather me give you, you know, me give you my money. Not, hey, if you use that, your console might die. You know, there's a bit of a difference between the two. So it's going to be interesting to see if Nintendo issue a statement, if there are any other tests conducted and perhaps this report is refuted. But it's definitely disappointing to see that this was ever the, th the case. Even if it has changed a little bit or a lot. Yeah, not brilliant. Anywho, that's me done for this video. It's run a little bit long, but I got a little bit carried away there. Thank you very much for watching. As always, your support is always appreciated and I'll see you next time.